Monaco on a mountain. Let's just say that that's what you find out of this Mount Panorama circuit. It's 23 turns, it's 6.21 kilometers. It is arguably one of the toughest challenges that a lot of drivers are going to have to face in this championship. There are no margins for error when you get to this track. And as every Australian knows, over 161 laps, there is always a twist in the tail. It will only be 14 though here today on Racebot TV and iRacing Live because we are at the 60 plus Racing Adventures League as qualifying currently is winding itself ever so slowly down here towards the end of the session. Paolo Bonacera is on a flying lap then as we speak of the 30 vehicles that have turned up here today. Currently 2.11.0 is quickest lap time so far which would Put him outside of the 107 cent times if we were running that sort of rule. But Bonacera, final corner, charging over to the line. And we'll find a lot of time. Goes to a 2089, but still a full second off of Wally Molesby in 27th position. I'm Jake Sperry, joined by David Haynes. David, this is your home track. This is Mount Panorama. This is Australia's finest circuit, some may argue. And the question becomes when you go to this sort of track. Firstly, survival. Secondly, how do you survive when you've got 30 vehicles, especially an open wheel, all trying to attack a mountain? Yep, exactly. It's not quite in my backyard, this circuit, but hey, it might as well be. I'll take all the credit for that. And exactly, what a difficult circuit. That's one of the reasons it's so well known, so well liked by racing drivers. There's a setup compromise almost to be made to a circuit like this. We've got really fast, long straights. That'll give us lots of slipstreaming, lots of passing opportunity. But exactly like you say, that top of the mountain, that middle section of the track, it's treacherous, it's difficult. You are millimeters away from disaster, but it's somewhere that a good driver can make up a lot of time. So these drivers, they're gonna have to be brave, but calculated today. They certainly are going to have to, as right now we are 20 seconds away from going to the starting grid. This is how things are going to line up. Domination for Bill Lawrence in qualifying. He is nine tenths of a second clear of the reigning champion, two times a winner, Stefan Rosgen in second position. John Unsby will start from third with Stephen Karkner in fourth. Bob Kern starts fifth with Manning Grinnan in sixth position. Joss van der Ven won last week. Of course, we didn't broadcast that one, but in seventh with Greg Garris in eighth. Kenneth Baldwin starts ninth and Philippe Chauvin rounds out the top 10. John Morgan, Mark Robertson, 11th and 12th with Bruce Poole and Kenneth Duma. 13th and 14th. Richard Coulomb and Remigio de Pasco are 15th and 16th. Uh, Jared Florison and Joel Martin are 17th and 18th. Fred McIntosh, Jack Turner rounds out row 10. Row 11 sees Franz Brink and David Riley. Mark Lisson, Paolo Preto, Jay Friels, uh, Gianni Rispaldo, Wally Mosby, and Paolo Bonacera makes 28. Two drivers didn't set qualifying times. They were PJ Sally and Roy Hall. So 30 drivers shall take to the grid. They've got themselves two minutes to grid up, and then we'll have a miniature pace lap, shall we say. Only going to the chase, and then they've got themselves that fabled Murray's corner to finish off the lap, but surprising maybe in qualifying that Stefan Rosgen has been so comprehensively beaten, David. Well, indeed, to find a margin like that, that's a lot. And you imagine that kind of confidence for Bill Lawrence will follow through into the race. That's going to make it difficult for Stefan Rosgen if he's going to keep up and set a good result. But as we know, the rules are narrow and they can bite at any given point in time. For Lawrence, it's a case of how do you claw back points in a very, very important championship such as this one. Because 
That gap at the top of the table is looking at 12 points at the moment. And that is with Stefan Roosjen missing an event as well. John Unsby tied on points. Mark Robertson just five points behind that. But Pace Cart moves over left and dives down onto pit road. Pace behind Bill Lawrence. Can't afford to beat the pace car off. Checks up a lot and gets going. And oh my goodness me, there was a little bit of a jump potentially there by John Unsby. Remember, you have to overtake around the outside for you to make it happen. Three wide into Hell's Corner and backing out of it then was Jos van der Ven in fifth position. An eclectic start then goes forward for Bill Lawrence. He got the jump that he wanted. Rosegen now having to work hard as they make their way up the mountain for the first time of 14 here this evening. And now for Karkner and co. You see Rosegen trying to get up into play. Something interesting I heard from Karkner just before the start of our broadcast was he's only finished one out of six races he's done so far this week at this track. So Karkner understands that he is going to be under pressure to finish this one. But David, it is a clean start by all. Yeah, exactly. We saw Stefan Rostjens lost a couple positions off the start. Ooh, oh my, we've had an instant. Someone is in the wall there indeed, Jake. That's Florison who was involved in that one. As we look back, Jack Turner got caught up in it as well. So we're going to get a replay of exactly what happened. They sort of came onto the scene late, the likes of Jack Turner. That was all with the likes of Gerard Florison. So an incident then at the cutting it normally does happen oh it's a solo incident i think one went up into the wall then for and co would get collected i believe in their own separate incident slowing down to make things happen the two teammates then come together so for had an incident ran into john martin because i believe that was richard coulomb up and over and out of the event as things stands there david Yep, there's known to be kangaroos around the circuit here, but Richard Coulomb has hop, skipped and jumped over the wall and out of the racetrack. That is not an ideal start, not even close. No, and whoever's tennis court that is, they will uh, be playing tennis with Richard Coulomb's car in just a little bit. But battle going on then, third, well actually second place backwards now as one lap is scored complete here in this event. So that is Bill Lawrence out and away, a second and a half on the opening lap. John Unsby in second, Karkner's in third, Roshgen fourth, Van der Ven in fifth, and then you've got Grinnan and Baldwin who are sixth and seventh as things stand. But John Unsby's being reeled in at the moment here, David. He's got to be careful because Stephen Karkner is within six tenths of a second and that draft down the two straights are going to be so, so pivotal as the only two real prime overtaking opportunities. John Morgan washes out behind. He was battling it out with Philippe Chauvin on his debut. Bruce Paul will go around the outside now at the cutting and take a position. Yeah, we're going to watch on board with the replay of that one, how that happened through the second corner of the track. Yeah, John Morgan's just gotten out a bit too wide there and hasn't found enough grip to carry his momentum up the hill. No, he hasn't, and that, of course, has cost him a big position and a chunk of time to boot as well. Down the S's section, they come for the first time, or for the second time, sorry, of this event. And I was looking at Karkner's line. He was very close to that inside wall just before the dipper as they now go into the forest elbow. Contrasting lines between the drivers, second and third. Unsby opened up the corner. Karkner was very, very narrow and tight and pretty much playing the safe line as he now gets the toe heading towards the chase. This fantastic fastest point of the track. Karkner hitting 240 kilometers an hour in his Pro Master, looking down to the inside to make it happen. Now he's got to go the long way around the John Unsby, which is not going to be helpful. Unsby runs wide though through the exit. He's got to be careful. Karkner goes around the outside. Roche thread the needle. Oh, there's contact. And into the wall goes Karkner. One in seven. Roche up to second. Wow, that was a very exciting little passage of play right there. So, of course, we're going to get a replay of it. Stephen Karkner there, you see, he just high sides it. He gets beached almost on that outside curve. Not a lot of ground clearance in these cars, and that's an aggressive curve out there. He nearly had the move done, and then unfortunately, as he's come back onto the track, 
think that was Joss Van Der Ven was trying to take it three wide when they just weren't expecting it. It was Roosjen trying to take it three wide and as they didn't expect it, there was a little bit of contact and Karkner's bad luck seems to continue here at Mount Panorama. Now Jos van der Ven, as you were saying, is now into fourth position and is searching for a way here to get around John Unsby. Of course, van der Ven was the winner one round ago, so definitely holds the form book in his hand as he makes his way then up through Griffin's Mount and heading towards the likes of Solomon Park, the Frog Hollow, the Villamy Park as well, coming up. So a lot of opportunities then to go out there and make things happen. The issue now is those who want to get back out and going again, remember, in terms of fast repairs, there are no limits here to a fast repair. It is a case of you are going to find traffic and it is already coming into play. As now Manning Grinnan gets on the rear here of the Unsby train. Yep, and we had a great little onboard here from Jos van der Ven, just showing us how difficult it is across the top of that mountain. But Jos van der Ven is up three positions from where he started, and he is right on the gearbox of those other cars, picking up a good draft. Yes, and you can tell there is a difference in setup because it seems Jos van der Ven can't find a way back to John Unsby, who seemingly is set up for the straight on the brakes into the chase they come along and there's not much movement going to be happening between those but maybe a chance at Murray's if you're brave Yoss who is a former champion the inaugural champion actually in this series so through the left hander no opportunities to go out there and make the move so it'll just be a waiting game for a little bit longer. Battle further back in the field though, Jay Friels versus David Riley. This one is for 13th position. Out on track, good little scrap with the McLaren West seeming, or shall we say, uh, McLaren West inspired car going at it against the red of Jay Friels. And looking at Jay Friels' car, it seems like he has no damage to speak of at all as he looks to try and get himself put on one little lockup though there as he headed through Hell's Corner. Yeah, not the ideal run out of that first corner for this long uphill straight, but I agree with you there. That sort of throwback Formula One inspired livery looking very nice, even if that's not quite the proportions of an Adrian Newey designed F1 car. Nope, not quite the proportions, but through the right hander of turn two, that being Quarry, unable to go and make that happen. So, oh, car in the wall, that was Florison for a second time. So, this time in a different place, he was being caught by the Van der Ven battle for third position. And oh my goodness, he gets pancaked twice. He almost got double teamed there. A la WWE, a double team maneuver because Unsby ran into the rear and then Manning grin and got a slide and bang, Florison goes into the wall. Well, that's what you get for being lap traffic, being approached up the mountain. In. It happens just like that. Battle though for the race lead is on. All of a sudden, Bill Lawrence has been caught by Stefan Rosgen. And Rosgen will be thinking about, can I get away around? Answer for the moment at 235Ks is that he is stuck, unable to make a big lunge. Getting in the mirrors though, on the brakes, but unable to go and make that move. Rosgen and Lawrence then battling it out. One and two in the championship. And that onboard shot that we had through the chase is higher than the driver's eye level. It makes that corner look easier than it is. It's almost an unsighted apex. And we saw that caught Bill Unsby out earlier. He went in too hot. But now Stefan Roosten was very, very clean. And he's right up in that draft of Bill Lawrence as they come up the first and this, but it's also the second longest straight on the circuit, Mountain Straight. Yes, and up the mountain they will charge. I will say something. I uh, spend a little bit of time with Swift Racing, and the Swift Racing team boss is from Bathurst himself. But down the inside goes Stefan Rosgen, comfortably taking the position. Lawrence got out of the way by an acre and a mile as the move was completed. Bob Kern unlaps himself then on Bill Lawrence as he feels that he has the pace. Van der Ven currently. Rosgen nearly spun it, and that's a, that's a someone's in the wall there. The yeah, lap down car in the wall. Yeah, that was Bob Kern at the at the cutting. So there was a little bit of a moment for Stefan Rosgen. He went sideways into the wall when Bob Kern scared in comparison. And just like that, Bill Lawrence has the lead back once more. Rosgen with a rare mistake giving Bill Lawrence the lead back. It's not often that you slide at the cutting though, David, and survive to tell the tale. 
my thoughts exactly there, Jake. He was a very, very lucky fella to get away from that with no damage on his uh, Pro Mazda car. And, but Bill Lawrence says, thank you, I'm Moses here parting this Red Sea, and back into the lead he goes. Years back into the lead, but all of a sudden, Jos van der Ven is on the train, one, two, and three. Also, a great battle going on for fifth position. Greg Garris versus Philippe Chauvin. This one happening about six seconds back off of your leaders at the moment. So Chauvin and Garris trying to work together to get back into play. Back, though, to your race leader, Stefan Roosgen, on the brakes, left-hander of the chase. Not quite forthcoming, but the pit stop window, though, is very crucially open, so if anyone wants to dive down onto the lane, they may do so at this stage. Look how close Roshan is, heading himself into Murray's corner, the final corner out on circuit. But for the moment, at least, it seems that Stefan Roshan knows he's got to go on the chase. He's got to make some moves. Van der Vendo waiting. You cannot be too aggressive as Bruce Poole dives down onto pit road. We'll see how long that service takes potentially on our timing screens and so forth. And that'll give us an idea for what's a quick pit stop, what's a slow pit stop. But I think in that lead battle, Jos van der Ven, as we're currently watching that Bruce Poole pit stop, he's in exactly the popcorn position, as I like to say, because he's seen Bill Lawrence and Stefan Roestchen fight, slow each other down a little bit, and he's right there in a prime position to take the lead or to play strategy how he wants to play it. Any of those top three could be up for grabs for them if they play their cards right. It certainly could be up for grabs, so these drivers now have to be careful. Roshgen finding the pace, it seems, of Anderven doesn't quite have it. Lap on lap, Bill Lawrence, for all his qualifying efforts, seemingly can't get it done in the race. So much more confidence, though, from Jos van der Ven. Down the hill on the... the what I call the S's section, and now that's going to mean that Jos van der Ven has to back out of it because he can't make the move on Stefan Rosgen, who seems a lot more confident when it comes to the straights and the highest speed corners. So a lot of differences being shown. There's actually Greg Garris has lost the position to Philippe Chauvin. That was the battle for fifth position. That one happening all the way back at turn number two on circuit with a very comfortable move and Chauvin waltzing away from Garris at the moment in fifth place here, uh, David. Yeah, good job by him to get clear before the turn in for turn two because we've seen a few people just not find the grip on the outside of turn two. If you get to the inside of turn two, that looks like the way to do it. Stefan Roestgen there looks out of the slipstream of Bill Lawrence before the braking zone, does nothing about it, and the three of them still all in a line. And now Jos van der Ven says, I can play that game as well. Certainly can the halfway stage then coming into view at the end of this lap and of course none of those top three have come down in and made their one scheduled stop of the day. Chauvin hasn't come down in nor has Greg Garris so a lot of drivers then choosing not to come down and make that stop early here but as we all know here David it is going to be a case of when do you make the move Van der Ven thinks it's now at the cutting and can't quite get it done but he does run wide and that's going to cost him a few tenths of a second here but he should be able to pull it back if he uses the draft well Yep, indeed, you said it and we saw it last lap. Jos van der Ven seems to be very quick over the top of the mountain here. He was so aggressive through the dipper. Maybe we'll see that again. Stefan Rostjen is so close to Bill Lawrence through here as they approach Skyline. Yes, and through Brock Skyline they go right, left, and right down the hill through the next right into the dipper of the left and back out through the right once more as you can see just how they check up over each other. Roshan struggling here comparatively to Lawrence, but a big lock again at the brakes and that front right seemingly getting worse and worse on Roshan as he tries to find some grip. Finds himself a very good run out of that corner though, able to make something happen. He attacks Bill Lawrence now looking for the race lead. He'll go to the inside to make that happen. We'll switch over to the outside. Will Bill Lawrence now find a way to defend it? He does not for the moment and hits the brakes as the championship leader now becomes the race leader at the end of lap seven. Question comes, who dies, who dares to come onto pit road once more? Nobody is the answer as they head through the left hand. I may even say 
that this is going to be one of those races where they go probably to about lap 10, lap 11 to go and make something happen here, David, just because you have a lot of fuel saveability just by, you know, just lifting off the things with two very long straights as there's traffic coming out of the pits, and that's Jay Friels. Yeah, exactly. If you're Jos van der Ven, he's done really well in the draft here as the leaders go too wide once more. Bill Lawrence will have the inside. But it, exactly, if you're Jos van der Ven, I'm not sure you're going to gain much from pitting by yourself. So, yeah, as we saw on the outside of turn two there, not working for Stefan Rostin. And he might even lose his position to Jos van der Ven as he tries to brave it around the outside of the cutting. And it oh. almost works, but they're losing time to Bill Lawrence doing that, Jake. They are, and well, that was a little bit of desperation I felt there by Stefan Rochen. He wants to keep second. He washed out on that off camber turn at number two. Always a very, very difficult corner to get right. It is a one line Supsal corner, but that was one where Stefan Rochen knew okay, I still want this position. Van der Ven may be quicker, but if I still got a nose, I'm going to make him fight for it. But look again at how Jos van der Ven attacks the downhill and just halves the gap it seems to Bill Lawrence leaves Stefan Rosgen in the dust once more and right now Jos van der Ven is probably the quickest man on track he started in seventh he's pulled his way up into third position remember there's a second race that comes along here tonight as well so if you can't get it done in race one you've got race two to go out there and get it and for the moment at least it seems Jos van der Ven moves to the inside quick fire lightning strikes from him and he moves himself into the race lead just like that so Jos van der Ven leads this one at the end of lap eight any takers for any takers I think Rosgen's diving Rosgen is going for an undercut yeah oh, exactly he's just what run wide thinking? just ran wide and that was a big mistake for Stefan Rosgen he's got to be careful about that I also saw van der Ven run wide as well up to the final corner so both drivers then first and third making mistakes as now Rosgen's advantage is gone Yep, exactly. You can see it, how tricky that pit entry is. There's sort of a left-hand turn, then a right-hand turn, then a left, and then a little chicane in there as well. And Stefan Rostrin has just come in too hot, not braked it enough to stay out of the gravel on that left-hand turn. I don't know if he'll pick up a penalty for that, an unsafe pit entry, but it's definitely not the quickest way of doing it. No, it's certainly not. And David, why is it that Australian pit entries here on iRacing are always so difficult? Phillip Island, is that what you're thinking of? That's a very difficult one. Oren Park's got a sort of a chicane in it. Uh, look, I can't say for sure, but yeah, it, it's three for three on weird pit entries, isn't it? It is, as Gianni Raspaldo also struggles trying to get onto pit road. He runs a little bit wide over that S's kink as well. It's catching everybody out, it seems, at this stage in the event. Other battles going out on circuit, the answer is, there are none, it seems, apart from the battle for your race lead. We've got a battle off of pit road, though, which is very interesting. Franz Brink and Kenneth Duma coming out pretty much together. And that will come along with Jack Turner as well, who is a lap down. So they're all going to come together and have their own little scrap. But at the moment, it seems that all eyes focus for the race lead battle at the moment, as Bill Lawrence has lost himself probably about three four tenths of a second over the course of this lap van der ven has been stretching his legs and you can see he used all of his road tax through the chase and that has done him a good service bill lawrence now dives onto the lane allows van der ven to continue on his merry way and he shows stefan rosgen how you take a pit road here yeah exactly and watch watch here are the yellow cones right there where the pit lane speed limit starts so that difficult tricky bit to the entry there you've got to attack that with full speed because it's not under the pit lane speed limit and i think bill lawrence maybe playing it cautious he did a good job there but i don't think he attacked all of the time that there is to make on the pit entry here jake no i think he wants to attack on the outlap which i think is a better option here's stefan rosgen though 
coming out to the final corner. And look who he's got for company. It's Manning Grinnan. And I think Grinnan was the first driver to come down in and make a pit stop. Out and away then comes Bill Lawrence. And he will be leapfrogged here by Stefan Roosjen. And if he's not careful and doesn't get into line, he may be leapfrogged by Manning Grinnan. And in fact, he will because Grinnan has kept very quiet in this event and now gets the position which he has so vitally, vitally wanted. And now into net third goes the blue Manning Grinnan car. Yeah, well done. Not quite on our radar for the last five or so laps, Manning Grinnan, but now running third position overall with Jos van der Ven yet to pit. That could still potentially be second depending on how that goes. Manning Grin is absolutely in the top five with a chance of a podium or even a win if it all plays to their favour in the last lap. Oh, he's searching at McPhillamy Park, hoping to find a way past Stefan Roshen. Do you dare go too wide at Brock Skyline? No, he thinks better of it as he heads down looking for the dipper. And then the chase. Oh my goodness, how wide do you want to go at the dipper there? Uh, Mr. Stefan Roosgen as he gets away with one ton murder. And well, it seems that Manning Grinnan just eased out of it there. Didn't know where Roosgen was going to go, so he took advantage of that. Race leader in though, Jos van der Ven, a lot more aggressive when it comes to the pit limiter. And that's crucial as well to note here because it is a limited pit limiter. So. Limited pit limits, Jake. You are an, an OP commentator, not. Uh, but you, you find yourself, though, with a... Oh, my goodness, I've just seen Manning Grinnan just go up and over Roy Hall in a separate incident. We were talking about Manning Grinnan and how he had that possibility. I was going to say that you have a pit limit compared to Skip Barber's, but there we see Manning Grinnan overshooting it on the brakes. Roy Hall was trying to get out of the way, and Manning Grinnan couldn't get into a position where he could stop the car safely that day. Yeah, exactly what you see. Stefan Roosten looks to the inside. So Roy Hall slows down, but Roy Hall was on the racing line, which is not what Manning Grinnan was expecting. In the front of that car, oh, it, it's a, a pro Mazda that only a mother could love. Yeah, it, it is, and I, I'm not sure even the mother would be too happy about the way that it will come back home through the front door. But look at how Van der Ven has just eclipsed everybody in the stop. He's got a gap bigger than everybody else has and I wonder in this situation here David has he been doing the fuel save or oh, another mistake for Roshgen around the outside of the cutting will go Bill Lawrence and that is second position change I'm wondering here if Van der Ven decided to short fill the stop thinking that he saved a lot of fuel over the course of this event yeah, seeing it on my timing screens, we get another angle of Stefan Roosgen's little half spin, not for the first time in the cutting, but it, on my timing screen, he was maybe a second shorter on the fuel fill than Bill Lawrence and Stefan Roosgen, but a second and a half, almost two seconds quicker in the pit lane. So just better with how he put on the limiter, better with how he took off the speed limiter, um, you know, perfect angle stopping in the box, all of those little things, and also, Boy, was he looking pacey right before his pit stop as well. So I think he's just done everything right. And from battling with Bill Lawrence and Stefan Rothschild before the pit stop, boom, a six-second lead with just a couple laps to go. Things looking very good for Jos van der Ven, up six places from his starting position. Yes, it is looking very, very good indeed. Battle, though, for the final spot inside of your top ten, Kenneth Uma in a scrap with a certain Mr. Franz Brink, who started this one today in 21st position. So Franz now looking for a top 10. There's also a little scrap going on between Bruce Poole and John Morgan. Let's go to this one because Bruce Poole down the inside now of Captain Morgan. And well, Captain Morgan, it seems, needs a little bit more punch as they head into the left-hander of the chase because he's just lost six-tenths of a second on the brakes, if not half a second. That was a spicy one, Jake, as we get the replay here. And you look at the chase here, you've got that right-hand kink before the main bulk of the corner is a left-hander. So he's used the rock inside of the kink, which sometimes becomes the outside if you haven't got clear enough. But then he ended up perfectly on the racing line to carry all of the momentum through the chase perfect move. That is how you overtake here at Bathurst. That is a 
perfect overtake if ever you saw one. We've got three little scraps going on. We've got Lawrence versus Rose Jen. We've got ourselves, of course, the Morgan Pool battle and the Duma uh, Brink battle that's going on at the moment. Haven't given a lot of love, though, to the driver in fourth position here at the moment, David. And that's Kenneth Baldwin. Quiet run today. Ninth to fourth was behind Manning Grin and came in early and has himself about nine seconds to the Roche and Lawrence battle and about five back to John Unsby. This has been a stellar run by Baldwin. Quiet achiever, and sometimes that's what you need to do. If we're talking about you too much, uh, maybe you're having too much of an adventurous time. So Kenneth Baldwin to just run his own race, end up in fourth position, not make too many mistakes, no damage visible on that car. Good on him, as I think Stefan Roestchen may have gotten past Bill Lawrence. He just did at the chase, and uh, he's done very, very well to slow it up as well and get the move sorted. So Roestchen back to second, but we've seen multiple mistakes from the German, which has cost him on multiple occasions a position, arguably a shot of victory here today, which is the last thing he would have been thinking of about as Jay Friels has to get heavy on the brakes behind Mark Lazon. Lazon himself having a great run in 12th position. Often see him towards the back of the field, which is a, a nice change, I think, is the right way to go about this from David. It's nice to see drivers, especially in the 60 plus league, finding ways to improve their pace and improve their times. As I've been keeping an eye on fourth as well, John Unsby's catching. Yeah, exactly. So we were praising Kenneth Baldwin, but maybe not quite quick, not looking quick in a straight line there at all. Just uh, maybe giving it up even, but you know, it's still within the top five for sure. Is there something wrong with that car? It's looking very slow in a straight line. Well, I was just looking at it and that was bizarre. I think he completely backed out of it. Didn't John Unsby's just hit the wall, though, out of the, the cutting there. That front left not looking good on his car as we get a replay wow. of it. So he's following in the slipstream up into the first bit of the cutting. That works out there. Turns in. Apps. It just snapped on him. It's just, it's just yep. snapped on him, trying to put the power down. And it's so easy to do. Just trying to get aggressive. You're up the hill. You don't have the same levels of grip there. And David... Car snaps in the wall. John Unsby, championship contender, pretty much in championship turmoil. Yeah, it was very, very late in the corner. There's a few bumps around that bit there where if you try and hold the throttle wide open and the car's not completely planted, that's the kind of thing that can happen. And that's why this circuit can throw up all kinds of different results because it's not easy. And we were saying some people are having a better run of it today than they might normally. Maybe it's just a track that suits them. Maybe it is, but the white flag comes out, the final lap then in full view for Jos van der Ven, but that gap's coming down. A second a lap at the moment. It is fuel minus 100. You're not going to make it, it seems, at the moment, the way van der Ven is driving, and that is going to be some very, very cautious final laps, or maybe just trying to just bring it home. It doesn't matter if you win by a thousandth or a little bit more than that. It's just about get yourself home. Rose Jen still under pressure, though, from Bill Lawrence. That has championship implications to get more Mark Scaifer quotes in, as many as we can before the end of this one. Through the right-hander of the cutting, then, goes the two, then, at the second and third positions. Van der Ven currently just playing that cautious role, has just ma managed the gap and has done very, very well in terms of his own little scrap. And I have to say, it has been one of those races for Jos van der Ven where everything has come up and pulled his number through Skyline then for the final time. Roshan still being chased down by Bill Lawrence here in race number one. On the brakes for the dipper, the pair of them go and Lawrence is pretty much primed for an overtaking opportunity. Now comes the next question. 
Yoss, do you have enough fuel to get yourself over to the line at full pace? Because that gap has been coming down. That gap has halved since his pit stop from six seconds down to about four and now down to three. And look at that. Hard to the inside goes a certain Mr. Rosgen. Bill Lawrence now moving to the outside because Rosgen decides, well, I want the inside for the chase. Too wide, they'll go into it. No room being given. On the brakes goes Rosgen, the championship leader, but Lawrence has his number. Jos van der Ven, though, he will slowly make his way to the line and at a pedestrian pace, Jos van der Ven plays the fuel number to perfection and wins the opening race of the evening. Bill Lawrence comes second. Stefan Rosgen will come home in third position and it will be a long, long wait for Bruce Poole because Kenneth Baldwin has had an incident on the final lap then of this race. That was heading down the hill at the Big Dipper. David, you got an eye on that one. He just tried to put the power down and the tyres weren't there. I'm not 100% sure I did, but thankfully we're going to get a replay and here it is right now. That's a bit wide on his entry to the Dipper and trying to get the power back up. Lights up those rear tires, not unlike we saw John Unsby do, and the thing just keeps turning into the wall, and boy does the car not like that. Those walls do not forgive, not even close. Not even close at all, we still got a couple of battles. Man and Grinnan though, I think's out of fuel, making his way to the line. He has been involved in a couple of incidents that have cost him damage. He'll make his way to the final corner and finish this one off. Kenneth Duma will take a position away, and that position will be eighth, so it'll be ninth there as Jay Friels has a big moment at the final corner. He'll drop a position as we see the likes of Paolo Preto holding off Gianni Raspaldo. But the final battle then, Richard Coulomb versus PJ Sally. This one going on for 18th position. There's David Riley there as well, who is not very comfortable with one corner left to go. Now look at this, really struggling to get the power down. And down the inside goes one, maybe two, as Coulomb's thinking, well, do we go three wide into final corner? They touch on the brakes into the final corner. David Riley, I think, just held off. Coulomb's going to get a great run. And, oh, that was close. But David Riley, good battling. He holds on to keep that position. Classified results, then, are going to come up on your screen right about now. Seventh to first, then, for Jos van der Ven. It all came up, van der Ven as he takes the race victory. Bill Lawrence comes second with Stefan Rochelle in third. The gap in the end was 2.1 seconds with an uber fuel save from Van der Ven to win the race. Bruce Paul finishes in fourth, a full 38 seconds off your race winner with John Morgan in fifth and Greg Garris in sixth position. John Unsby, despite issues, came home seventh with Kenneth Doomer in eighth. Manning Grinnan having uh, run out of fuel finishes ninth with Franz Brink rounding out the top 10. Looking further down, the likes of Mark Lazon and Wally Molesby having some great drives to 11th and 12th. Paolo Preto, Gianni Raspaldo, Kenneth Baldwin running himself into issues on the final lap then of this race. David Riley comes home 16th with 17th and 18th. PJ Sally and Richard Coulomb. Drivers a lap down though, we're a lot. The likes of Stephen Karkner, Paolo Bonacera, Bob Kern, Mark Robertson. Jack Turner, Philippe Chauvin, uh, Jay Friels, and Joel Martin. Cars three laps down was Roy Hall, and three drivers failed to make the finish. Michel de Pasqua, Jared Valorison, and Fred McIntosh as well. Well, we can go straight on to interviews. Got three waiting and ready. First off, Jos van der Ven. Jos started seventh, but it seemed that every time we caught an eye on you, there was a position here, a position there, and ultimately a gap which was just enough to hold on to towards the end. Uh, yeah, um, I had a, a, a bad qualifying, two, uh, two uh, bad laps, and then started the race at seventh in, indeed, and um, well, I think I made it uh, to the first place with um, a good pit stop where I took less fuel than the rest of us and uh, that was maybe the difference at the end and then uh, I had uh, yeah 
there were some mistakes from uh, from other people uh, in the overtaking the traffic, I guess, uh, which helped me also. Well, you had a lot of help in some respects, but let's talk about your strategy because it seemed that you were getting clawed in again and again on the final few laps. Was it a case of uh, you put in less fuel than everybody else and had to go and do a fuel save for the last three laps or so? No, not uh, really full, full uh, fuel save, but uh, just uh, consolidating my uh, position uh, and take less risk, I guess. Well, you've done the hard part, which is getting a victory here at Mount Panorama. But of course, race two is going to be very important as well. Are you looking to go and take the double so that your championship rivals don't get any, shall we say, equal points to you coming out of this event? Well, I think that looks like a good strategy. Well, it seems that good strategies are in order. Shout out sponsors. Who gets it done for you, Jos? Okay, um, well, I thank you uh, uh, for, um, for the, the organizers uh, for this league. And I enjoy it already for the eighth season. And thanks to my old wife uh, who let me race. No worries at all. Jos van der Ven then, a big, big victory then in race number one. David Haynes is standing by with the driver who came home in second position. That being Bill Lawrence. Bill Lawrence, second place in the first race. Looked like Jos van der Ven just had you beat on strategy. What are you going to have to do to catch him in race two? Well, I hope I can stay with him. Uh, I took too much fuel, one gallon in the pits, uh, which gave him the advantage coming out. This circuit you can't fear it, but you've got to respect it if you're going quickly. How difficult is it with these cars, especially around the top section of the circuit, with the walls so close? Yeah, it's very, very difficult, and it it causes uh, most of us to be very cautious, but um, for some reason I had confidence this time around and was able to drive it fairly, fairly well, I think, this race anyway. What corner around here would you say gives you the most trouble or you're most scared of? Well, it has to be the S's uh, and coming into the dipper there. It, they're a series of very tough corners and uh, you just one, you're right on the edge if you're trying to do it quickly and just a, you know, a microsecond and you're into the wall. One little mistake. Going into race two, Jos van der Ven is going to try and take the win again to stop you getting the points. What have you learned from this race that's going to make you quicker in race two? Well, I hope uh, just being patient, uh, hit my marks and uh, do a better pit stop this time. And hopefully we'll be able to stay close and challenge at the end, I hope. Awesome. Well, good luck to you. Anyone you need to thank, well, we've got you on air. Well, first off, I got to thank you guys as once again, uh, you've done an awesome job and we here at 60 plus really appreciate it. And to the rest of my teammates and the league in general, great bunch of guys. We've got a bunch of new guys out uh, on the track today. So shout out to them. Thanks guys. Well, that's Bill Lawrence who comes home in second position overall. Stefan Roosjen was the man who finished home in third and Stefan a few mistakes there today. Not often that we get to see them from you, but Mount Panorama surely uh, one of those circuits which does bring out the mistakes in people. Yeah, it does, but it was not uh, Mount Panorama. It is uh, new pedals that I've got yesterday only. Ah, new pedals. So uh, a change in the equipment, always something that uh, plays a factor, but something that isn't really talked about. So... What has been your difference moving from your old pedals to your new pedals, which you found, uh, say, difficult when it comes to trying to adjust to the Pro Master? I came from the good old GT5. Um, everybody knows that these are the pedals all over the world, and uh, I made the mistake to get some Fanatec Elites with load cell. Ah, okay. So going to a load cell break always is a, a little bit more difficult, but... You've had a race, you've had 14 laps to get into the groove, you've got another 14 lap race coming up, so 
opportunity then knocks for you? Are you hoping then to get yourself a victory and maybe to salvage yourself some very good ones? Only when the guys make mistakes, not from my own. I'm too slow with these builds. I need some weeks. Well, you need some weeks, but we'll see how the second race unfolds. Stefan Rosgen coming home in third position. David, you've run yourself down through the paddock and you found John Unsby. Yep, John Unsby, seventh place. Looked like you could have done better than that. What was maybe uh, your undoing in this first race? John Unsby, do you have a copy? Well, I thought I had him, but I, I don't quite appear to, Jake. Well, it seems that we have a little bit of dead air here. We can't find Mr. Unsby, which is not ideal at this stage. So we will abandon the interview then uh, for the moment. But David, one race under or one race done in the books. Race number two shall be coming up very, very shortly. And that is a second chance for a lot of drivers here. And I'll be a second chance that's needed at Mount Panorama. Yeah, I have to say, for this kind of league, it's a great race format to have the two races back to back and effectively the, the drivers can, as you'd say, drop one race. It, it leads to some different strategies where maybe they try and bank some points in the first race, go hard in the second race, or, you know, around a difficult circuit like this, even the best of drivers will make mistakes when they're pushing. So it gives all of these guys that second opportunity to show their true pace and gives us plenty to talk about as well. It certainly does. We're going to step aside though here. The 60 plus racing adventures race here at Mount Panorama Bathurst. When we come back, race two and the second chance at points, prizes, well, everything you can find in between will be coming to you here on iRacing Live and Race Spot TV in just a few moments' time. done everything he could have done to try and get himself in the championship picture but 2018 has not been his year 2018 has not been with the Hooters year despite it being the last chance for oh my word have we just seen Matt Backham overtake Martin Cronkay on the final lap of the motor race we have Matt Backham takes the victory Hutu second Gregor Hutu in second place what have we just seen? Martin Kronke in third, and the title will go down to Kota. My word. I do not know what I have just seen. Silverstone a couple of years ago was the craziest finish I've ever seen to World Championship Series race until today. And I'm just having a look. He doesn't... I don't, what did Martin Kronke even do there, Jake? I, I think he was out. I, I honestly think he was out. I, I, I haven't seen anything like this before. He was struggling to get the power on. 
I, I, I don't think he was out. Maybe he was wanting to give Matt back in the victory because he was quicker, because he still had the championship. Oh my goodness, Martin. I think we have just seen the defining moment of the season. I have no idea what Conkay's done. We'll have to ask him for an interview. But Gregor saw an opportunity, sent one down to the inside on the final corner. And I think that Kronke wanted to give the victory, potentially, maybe not second. But this title's alive, Will. And De Jong has been given... ...to that final showdown. We're going to log two more in. Four are going to leave here disappointed. And they're getting ready to grid to roll off for this 200-lap affair. Vincent's field to control as they roll slowly at 40 odd miles an hour off the quarter to take the American Ethan on green flag. Round of eight racing once more from Dover. Second to last race of 2018. Sideways in the corner. The 12 machine holds it low and it unfortunately snaps back up the hill. There it is, he just lost it, coming down the back straight away, look out, and somehow doesn't get smoked by Zelensky, but that 27 was not as fortunate. And it side for that position what is right now position number three on the running order which could be a battle for the win potentially if this thing cycles out almost little contact off turn number four Conti continues to fight on the inside he continues to dig on the inside and this could be the most critical battle for what will be a race win we've seen all season long the 24 should have a better run off of the quarter on the outside but are those tires going to be too good into the quarter for the five to get the gap off the turn four he will push up and yet sir michael conti passes Leahy for what is third position and it'll be his second win in four weeks michael conti wins from dover second on the round of eight and he'll head to homestead in search of a second championship arguably as the favorite I'm Dave Kemmer. I'm the CEO and CTO at iRacing. Um, and uh, we started this back in 2004, so we're actually older than 10 years old, but we first opened up the uh, site to the public in 2008. It actually got started about 30 years ago um, when uh, we did our first game at Papyrus, which was Indy 500. Um, and that actually was just about 30 years ago, a little less. Um, I was working on it 30 years ago. Um, and that just, you know, led to IndyCar racing, NASCAR racing. We eventually did Grand Prix Legends, and then we took that Grand Prix Legends engine and put it on NASCAR uh, 4, you know, NASCAR 2002, 2003. And at that point, um, EA got an exclusive license with NASCAR, and, and uh, the company that owned us at that point, which was Vivendi Universal, um, decided to shut the studio down because they couldn't figure out another way to make money with the tech that we had. Um, and uh, it was just about that time that I got connected with John Henry because he had just bought the Red Sox and come to town and it turns out that he was a big fan of the NASCAR 2003 season. And um, so he came to the office just to visit one day and we got connected and you know, we were talking about the fact that this was going to be shut down and what could we do with it. Um, you know, certainly it didn't seem like Vendy had an interest in using the code base, so uh, he kind of helped us buy that code base back from them um, and set up iRacing, which we did in 2004. He got involved because he thought that the simulator was very cool. He just had a great time with it. In fact, he built up a league of his friends at home that. You know, and they apparently raced so much that uh, <laughs> several of them started to suffer burnout. <laughs> but no, they, I mean, 
he, he definitely is a, a dedicated sim racer. He's typing, he's typing, he's got it, he's got it, it's a new line of code! Okay, okay. There were a few things that we wanted to try to do. Um, in the, you know when we were starting up iRacing that would be different than what we had done before. One was to make a web-based service uh, for multiplayer. Um, it just seemed like a natural way to be able to market and reach people directly um, rather than through a store or selling a box. John was very interested in building a sport, um, you know, something that actually where there were rules and a, a, a you know, a sanctioning organization um, where it would really feel like what you're doing in the sim was meaningful. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of wanted to start from scratch. I mean, using the technology that we had from Grand Prix Legends, but we started just pulling pieces of that and we built the code base up essentially from the ground up. I think John put it as it's, it's sort of like, uh, in the old days of Papyrus, we, we were selling bats and balls um, and gloves. And, uh, you know, he said, hey, let's create the playground and the ball field and, you know, make the umps and uh, turn this into something. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, really when we started in 2008, we didn't have very much content. Um, but it was exciting right right off the bat for that very reason that we had these these rules people could understand hey this is what it what's at stake um and at this point 10 years in um i feel like we've really succeeded on that front i think we've executed on that vision just as well as i could have possibly hoped we would i've been surprised by how much progress we've made with the simulation it blows me away when I see it. It's just like, wow, this looks really good. There's so many pieces in there and they all work. Um, it's, it, it's just really awesome. It's way beyond what we had 10 years ago. we have a lot of stuff that's in development big things you know we've talked about the day night transitions the the new damage model the better sound engine there's just a lot going on that and these are bigger projects which take a while to do but when uh, when people see them and see the the results it's I think they'll really be pleased with it down towards the Parabolica and uh, we're getting all set for the start of three hours of racing around Monza here 
and uh, certainly going to be a good race. We're waiting for the green light. The green flag doesn't drop yet. It's down the line. Now the green flag comes out. Away we go then. Three hours underway here at Monza. As they head down towards Retifilio to start with. They're going three, four wide. Further down your field. Hopefully everyone gets themselves sorted out. There's a head in to turn number one now. This first chicane. So easy to make contact around here. We've got a car spot. Car spot and we've got more to Well, race one was in the books and it did a very, very successful job. That job was throwing a complete haymaker at the track. And we saw a very unexpected winner in Jos van der Ven. But race number two will be coming, of course, in just a couple of moments time. But we've got a small little matter that has to be dealt with first. And that matter is qualifying. And that qualifying effort is going to be so, so important for a lot of drivers in this field here on Racebot TV and of course on iRacing Live. I am Jake Sperry joined with David Haynes. And David, race one was interesting. Race one saw a lot of mistakes, which a lot of people we thought wouldn't make. Now there's reasons for all of this. Of course, you talk about Rose Gen's new load cell pedals. Talk about the likes of other drivers just getting caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. But my, is this race going to be very, very important now as we talk about the championship perspective moving forward to the second half of the season? Yes, indeed. We're you know, sort of a little bit past the halfway in this season kind of thing. And with this second race of the day here, everyone will be looking to either improve on how they did last race or take away points from their nearest rivals. It puts a different focus on this race than maybe the first one. And I think we might see that in how some of these drivers attack qualifying that's coming up soon and how they choose to attack the race. They've got a little bit different at stake than what they had in race one. They certainly do. And with more at stake, they've got a lot that they need to get absolutely 100% right as qualifying now is officially underway and has been underway for a good 45 seconds or so as they make their way up the mountain then to start their outlaps. So 
a lot of drivers understand, okay, there's a lot that can happen here in these sorts of outlaps. They've got to make sure they get time to get these laps in. They've got 10 minutes or two flying laps to get themselves working forward. Let's go on board with John Unsby in the 61. Now, Unsby had the unfortunate of finding an incident at exactly the wrong time. It dropped him a good four positions here over the course of the race, David. So, how do you attack a qualifying lap? Because at this circuit, a mistake happens at any time. So qualifying becomes even, I, I wouldn't say as important as maybe it should be. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's always a few ways to mentally approach it. And on board with John Unsby, indeed, we are. And he wasn't pushing it very hard. No times on the board yet in qualifying. So I think he's just got to approach it with the mindset of any improvement over race one is points, carry that momentum forward and see what's possible in later rounds. It is, and of course he is tied up points coming into this event with Bill Lawrence, who got himself uh, a very strong second place finish. So Unsby knows he's got to at least match that with Bruce Jen coming over the line in third. Ross van der Ven, though, for uh, a perspective, was down on 91 points coming into this race, and that is a massive boost with the 35 points he will pick up for a race victory here in this series. It's 35 for a win, it's 30 for second, and then there is 26 points for third place. So, as things stand, that gap at the top of the table comes down to eight points. So, eight points at the moment here, David. Qualifying coming up. It's not the case of things will improve and get better, as I just saw David Riley have a big, big moment. It's the case of, okay, these drivers need to get points. These drivers need to know how they are going to get these points, how they're going to stop others from getting even more points. Yeah, and the only way Jos van der Ven can do that is to win again and stop anyone else from taking those points. So we see his first intermediate on this flying lap, 46.745. You can tell from the body language as he comes over the skyline, comes towards the dipper. He's pushing pretty hard on this lap, not leaving too much to spare. Second intermediate, I think that looks good. I'm not 100% sure, but the body language of the car looks good. Jos van der Ven is pushing on this lap. It looks planted. It looks very, very sophisticated at the moment. Not slow, but it looks very sophisticated in terms of a lap. Now making his way over to the chase, the small kink right. And he doesn't use all of the track here at 237 kilometers an hour before mashing on the brakes into the left right at 128. Oh no. And he just runs wide and there's the oh no. That should be an off track as David, you oh no at that because it was a very good lap up until then. Yeah, he was looking really good. We saw in race one, Jos van der Ven was very quick through the bits over the top of the mountain. That's where he was gaining time on people, uh, other than just in the slipstream. And it was looking very good. And then, the, not the final hurdle, but the second final hurdle, he's gone in a bit too deep on the brakes. And we saw he took too much of the inside curb. That sent him going a bit straight. And I imagine that probably was an off track that invalidated his qualifying lap. Yeah, just bounces over the curb. That's all four wheels outside of the white line, center line of the car over in the grass. He'll have to back it up on his second lap, but now he's lost that banker opportunity. But he has. Stephen Karkner is currently the quickest man in qualifying 202.593. And for Karkner, this is a big second opportunity. Of course, finished a lap down after an instant on the second lap of the first race. So Stephen Karkner currently on the 202 patrol, which even Bill Lawrence wasn't able to do. A couple of tenths off of Lawrence's time in qualifying in the first event. Lawrence will be across the line behind Stephen Karkner. So Karkner's found something, a little bit of aggressiveness that he can use as he comes out of the forest elbow and onto the Conrod straight. The, shall we say, the signature straight here, David, at this track. Yes, indeed. The longest one on the circuit. And as uh, one of our favourite commentators likes to say, it leads into the fastest corner in Australian motorsports. 
So it, it's, it's a great little track, plenty of undulations, and it's where we see a lot of the passing happening. Not just in this series, not just in iRacing, oh. not just in race one here. Stephen Karkner also runs a little bit wide, but also in real life, it's where we see a lot of the passing opportunities happen. Stephen Karkner doesn't look happy with his run through the chase though, Jake. No, he doesn't, but look at Bill Lawrence in the 17 as Rose Gen goes to the pole just for the moment. Trumped by Bill Lawrence, 17,000. Says he can go quicker as now Jos van der Ven goes into fourth, one second off in qualifying. That just tells you just how important it is. Manning Grinnan goes to fourth position with his qualifying runs. Kenneth Baldwin does a 2044. That puts him in 11th place. Oh, it changed over the second lap. And, well, you've got some of the last drivers coming in. Wally Molesby then gets himself 23rd. A few drivers haven't set lap times then to start the second race. Let's go on board then with, I believe it is Paolo Prato on his debut. Number 93 hailing out of Club Brazil at the moment, which will make Hugo Luiz behind the camera. Very, very happy to see Brazilian representation in this series. On the brakes, Murray's corner over to the line. Paulo Preto currently in 16th position and stays in 16th position despite improving that time. But David, top three, one tenth. Look back, eight tenths to Manning Grinnell. Now, I just wanted to say, look at that Leighton House livery. Beautiful. And another Adrian Newey designed car tribute in this series but uh, uh, the important matters like you say at the top of our qualifying order that's so very very close between bill lawrence stefan rostian and stephen Kafka putting in a good lap but i think you know look jos van der ven john unsby both of them not quite up where they'd want to be and i'll tell you what else is quite surprising about these pro masters is that they actually attack the mountain and go quicker than the vh supercars do yeah, just by, uh, you know, maybe a second, a second or two, and that's not in a straight line because, like, you've called out some of the top speeds we've got going down here into the chase. That's maybe 70 kilometers an hour slower than what a V8 supercar does in a straight line. But the V8 supercar is a heavy car, doesn't have the downforce as much. So these pro Mazdas not in a straight line making up the time, but over the top of the mountain. These guys can keep the throttle wide, carry the momentum through the corners that a big heavy V8 supercar just can't do. That's very, very telling. One minute then until qualifying is score complete. And officially, nobody is out on track. So we can call qualifying completely done at this stage. And we'll go to the starting grid for this here at the second race. Bill Lawrence gets two pole positions and he's got championship rival behind. Stefan Rosjen, he's cut the gap down to eight. He will cut that gap down to seven if he picks victory and Rosjen finishes in second position. Stephen Karkner looking for redemption in third with Manning Grinnan fourth and the winner of race one, Jos van der Ven in fifth position. John Unsby shall start this one from sixth with Mark Robertson in seventh and Greg Darris in eighth. Philip Chauvin starts ninth with John Morgan, Captain Morgan himself, rounding out the top 10. Ennis Baldwin starts 11th with Jared Florison, needing a recovery in 12th. Bruce Paul 13th with Bob Kern in 14th. Row 8 sees Kenneth Duma and pa Paolo Preto with Mark Lazon and Joel Martin on row number 9. Row 10 sees Remigio de Pasqua and Richard Coulon with Fred McIntosh and David Riley on row 11. Row 12 is Wally Molesby and Paolo Bonacera with Gianni Raspaldo, Jack Turner, Jay Friels, Franz Brink, PJ Sally and Luis Morga all failing to set times in this 30 car grid for the second race of the day. Two minutes once more to grid yourself up or you start from pit road and David. Race one was interesting. Race two looks like it could be even more interesting. Two championship rivals, one and two on the field, but a lot of drivers, Van der Ven and Unspeed, want to get through. Don't count out Stephen Karkner. 
Yeah, there's plenty of drivers with a lot to risk the farm on in this second race. So, you know, I can't speak for how all of the drivers would mentally approach this two race format, but you can imagine some of them put their focus on maybe just getting a top five or a good result in the first race of some banker points, if you will. And then in the second race, maybe they'll be more aggressive out on track, more aggressive on the fuel strategy, all of those things. So there is definitely a possibility for yet more excitement in this second race. These are some of the best operators in a Pro Mazda that you will find over the age of 60. Let's get some more scapey coats out there, shall we, shall we not? But for the moment at least, I want to do something here. David, I want you to go and pick a winner. Okay, so Bill Lawrence is on pole but he didn't get the pit stops right in the first race. Stefan Roosten, very quick, but new pedals. Jos van der Ven, consistent, good with the pit stops, but he doesn't have, he doesn't have to risk it. So, Stephen, Stephen Karkner, you know, let's see someone else run well. Uh, number 75, Stephen Karkner, please. Put that in my fantasy uh, 60 plus racing adventures. And they say that's a gamble with one finish this week in seven starts at the Monaco on a mountain. So a lot of drivers with a lot of work to do and a lot of drivers know that the only way they are going to get themselves through is by gaining position on position on said position as Bill Lawrence for the second time this evening has control over the field. Rose Chen got caught out last time when it came to the start. He's got to get that absolutely right here in the second race. Pace car will dive down onto pit road. A large gap to Bill Lawrence, which he looked to exploit in the early stages. And he may just go early, and he does go early. Green flag, let's go, race two underway and it was a pretty slow start by Manning Brennan who is already 2 wide with Jos van der Ven into turn number one and van der Ven gets his man which is very very crucial at the opening corner as things look to stack up in the middle of the pack but no worries for the moment Grinnan not done though he will look to try and get it into turn number two no worries at all at the moment here David for Bill Lawrence as he makes his way up to turn two Yep, I thought maybe Stefan Roosten was going to get in Bill Lawrence's draft up to turn number two, but he holds on to the lead. A great start from Jos van der Ven, and my man Stephen Karkner there looking outside from the rear wing of Stefan Roosten. Oh. He's right up there, as invariably there's some contact. There is Bob Kearns in the wall, and now we've got almost a track blockage there, so a big, big... They're all in the wall. They're all in the wall, yeah, right. There was one in the wall, they were both in the wall, they were all in the wall. So, Gerard Florison again getting turned. This time he got a little bit of help from a bit of blue of Paolo Preto. And, well, it seemed that everybody just checked up from there. And we almost had ourselves a major, major track blockage. In fact, we did have a track blockage. Track was blocked. Throw out a red flag, potentially, and get the race restarted. Oh, no. This is sim racing. You keep going as we had ourselves a full track stoppage as we get ourselves back going again. Seems to have been a few issues for Jos van der Ven over the course of this one. He's not been able to gain as much as he wants to. Here comes Karkner, though. Battle for second position, then. As Stefan Roosgen wants to go through. And, in fact, it's a power move because it's going to be two for the price of one. Karkner to the race lead. Now that you've asked me to pick a winner, I'm emotionally invested, Jay. But that was a fantastic move, timing it to perfection, pulling out of the slipstream when it mattered. These three guys are going very quickly, but you saw there was some respect given there, but also some great, great racing. And now the top six are all within that, that one second gap of each other. They just about are. Manning Grinnan is nine tenths off of Stefan Rosgen in third position. John Unsby finds himself in sixth. Don't count out Mark Robertson, though, in seventh position. Still in the championship hunt, but has been very quiet so far. He's under pressure from the new boy, Philippe Chauvin. And the number 15 Frenchman moves to the outside to try and make the move. And he 
He's got himself superior over speed up the hill and not much more that he can do about that because Robertson loses the position and Chauvin gets himself through. But look at the traction off the exit from Robertson looking to the outside of the cutting. You don't try it on the outside of the cutting and as such he will back off and hold off the position for now. Yeah, that turn two has been trickier than maybe we would have thought. But up the front, Stephen Karkness still holding on to it from Bill Lawrence and Stefan Rostjen as they come over the tricky top of the mountain. Walls to the left, walls to the right. Yes, and now down through the dipper. One, two, three, four, five, and six goes. Uh, John unspeed has got to be careful about being dropped here because Jos van der Ven is always aggressive down the mountain. And for the moment, at least, Train of five resumes at the front of this one. The second train goes all the way back to 12th position. And Bruce Poole, who has actually uh, got a little bit of a gap now to John Morgan just in front. That second train is starting to extend out just a little bit. Greg Garris under pressure from Kenneth Baldwin in that scrap. But no moves then into the chase here on lap number two everyone fine and dandy bill lawrence probably playing the fuel game potentially early on in this one at lap two probably just waiting for the right moment to strike certainly has the pace here to do damage to karkner yeah a lot of these guys will have learned about their fuel consumption about their fuel number and maybe stefan roastgen will have learned about the pit lane entry from race one and now all of them will be primed ready to go in this race put their best foot forward as they go too wide for third position, Jake. And we saw there was a mistake from Bill Lawrence coming out of Murray's. Roshan wanted to attack, wasn't confident on the brakes. A man in Grinnan took full advantage of that on the exit and has picked apart Stefan Roshan into third position. Man in Grinnan, we sometimes see him on the Pro Mazda races done with Johnny Simon, or Jonathan Simon, I should say. But that there is just how easy an overtake can be done at this track. Manning Grinnan showed there, David, that he has the wily character to really think about, OK, how do I make an overtake? And more importantly, when? Yeah, we've seen some people, when the driver ahead makes a mistake, they get sucked into making the same mistake uh -oh. and don't capitalise. Is that, is that, is that uh -huh. Kuckner off very, very wide and... Oh, oh no, oh no. Oh, in the wall and into Manning Grinnan and the track gets blocked and Roschen gets a tap. Oh my goodness me, Stephen Karkner in a big, big instant up at Skyline and he got caught out by the lapped traffic. That was Remigio de Pasqua as they headed through the left-hander. Gets caught out by how slow de Pasqua is. He has to avoid it. He taps the wall on the right and he tries to do as much as he can to avoid it. Into the wall on the left, stopping it as much as he can. Grinnan gets a hit. Roschen ends up with a hit, as does Van der Ven, as does Unsby. Just like that, this race changes. John Unsby's now got to try and recover the damage. He's crabbing his way down the back stretch but drivers like Rose Jen now in all sorts of trouble drivers now like Jos van der Ven in a bit of trouble Grinnan in a bit of trouble Bill Lawrence leads and he's got away from all of this and all of a sudden Bill Lawrence may have just brought that gap in the championship down to seven as things stands in terms of points as Rose Jen again gets pit entry horribly wrong oh boy <laughs> what a what an action-packed little bit there. Bill Lawrence gets, inherits a, a big lead. And again, we're going to ride on board with Stefan Roschen. Comes in too hot, locks up the inside, doesn't make it turn. Those new panels maybe not working for him on hit entry. I think Jos van der Ven uh, and Manning Grinnan, the only other two of that top group to get away without any damage, is Jos van der Ven puts the move on Manning Grinnan to grab second. Bill Lawrence is the winner in all of this, though, Jake. I wouldn't say undamaged for Manning Grinnan. Look at the front right, or the front left, sorry, of his wing. It is crumpled up horrifically towards that, or away from that tyre. And that's going to expose the tyre and do a lot of aerodynamic issues there, David, which is going to be horrible in a car that needs that aero up the top of the mountain. Yeah, he's sticking with Jos van der Ven for the moment, but obviously Jos has gotten himself up, up to second place. 
And just in front of them, there's a spinner, and that was the lap traffic of Paolo Bonacera. So the Italian Turtles team struggling in the constructors battle even further because you can see there just caught the dipper and it, the car bottomed out and just snapped away from Bonacera. And that's why the dipper is arguably the toughest corner in the S's. The elevation change is massive. When these guys attack it hard, we see them get a couple tires in the air. Maybe Paolo Bonacera just had a bit too much steering angle in, and when the car landed and gripped up, it snapped him hard left, and the concrete wall has no mercy for a pro master. Oh, none whatsoever. So right now, Lawrence leads. Manning Grinnan was in second, but it's now Jos van der Veen. Grinnan is in third. Philippe Chauvin up into fourth. Mark Robertson in fifth. It is Greg Garris and Ramisha De Pasqua too wide. De Pasqua's lap traffic, but Garris makes his way through, potentially, on the grass. This is going to allow Kenneth Baldwin a chance to go through. Slow down penalty, I think, coming. And Kenneth Baldwin now moves himself up into sixth position ahead of Greg Garris. And now John Morgan wants to try and get the drunk man in front out of the way. But at the moment, Captain Morgan says, you know what? Just have another run on me, and we'll see if we can make a move in a few corners time. This is a fantastic scrap here. Sixth through to ninth, Kenneth Baldwin, Greg Garris, I think, goes to the inside, potentially. But regardless, these are all guys who stand to get a good result from this based on the misfortune of Rostian, of uh, Karkner, of Unsby. These are guys who might, you know, find themselves in the top 10 on a good day, but now a top five is possible if they can keep their race clean. Yeah, and their race needs to just stay consistent, like Sir John Morgan. Outside shot at the championship has got to do everything possible. Wally Molesby at the moment is inside the top 10. Now, let's talk Rosgen in 11th here, because yes, he's come in. Yes, he's made that stop. But David, at the same time, he's come in incredibly early at lap three to make that stop. I reckon he is unable, unless he does a massive fuel save run here on this second and this very long stint, I doubt that Rosgen can make it to the end without having to make a second stop. Yeah, he doesn't have the benefit of a draft partner right now either. Looking at the timing, he took about nine seconds of fuel. That's maybe that. a second, second, sorry? Be that, but Wally Molesby just in front of us had a big issue at Skyline. Yeah, indeed. So he, he might pick up a draft buddy now, but still, his pit stop time... It's close to being able to make it to the end, but he's going to have to work on that fuel number. Well, you can see here, just behind Molesby, he's got to think about how do I make the move. The answer is going to be straight to the inside. Go Stefan Rosgen. He has no time for Molesby and says, well, he tried, but not much more you can do there. Rosgen makes the position, gets a heavy amount of curve through the first part of the chase as well. Gap at the front of the field now up to five seconds. The difference in lap times over that last lap was a 2.034 from Bill Lawrence and also a 2.034 from Jos van der Ven. So very, very equal between them at the moment, which is quite telling at the moment as Franz Brink actually comes down onto the lane and he will make his first stop of the day just as the pit stop window opens at the end of lap five. Yeah, so for second, Jos van der Ven and Manning Grinnen are still stuck together. If they work together, they might be able to catch Bill Lawrence. But that gap that they have behind him, that's about what Jos van der Ven made up through the pit stops in the first race. I still wouldn't count him out. I wouldn't. We've got a fantastic four-car scrap bow right at the back of the field. This is 20th to 23rd. You've got Kenneth Doomer at the back of this train, Bob Kern, Gerard Florison, and Richard Coulomb there. Now, it's two different teams battling here for the four cars, and it's Coulomb and Florison's team, which is led by Captain Morgan, just in front, with Bill Lawrence's team, which has Bob Kern and Kenneth Doomer in it, just behind. So this is going to be a telling battle for the Constructors' Championship. So right now, what Bob Kern has to be thinking about here, David, is, OK, I need to probably take one position, maybe both here in this situation. Yeah, sort of flying in formation is how it looks with the two green cars leading the two white, blue and yellow machines. 
Uh, Richard Coulomb almost pulling ahead a little bit as Mark Lasson comes out of the pits in front of him and joins the train to make it five. He does as John Morgan, I think, has had himself an issue over this lap. So we'll get a look at exactly what has happened to Captain Morgan and he's been caught out at the Forest Elbow of all places. So Morgan gets himself through the right-hander on the brakes, car snaps because it's not there and straight hard right into the wall. And that's the unprotected part of the wall as well. That's right on the cliff face. And that is arguably the hardest hit you can have here at this circuit bar and going into the tires at the chase. Exactly. You can't lick your elbow, but he's had a lick of oversteer and it's put him into the wall on the outside of the elbow. Back in the old days, there wasn't even a concrete wall there. It was just plain cliff face. So not much of an improvement, but the battle for second is spicy. It is spicy as Manning Grinnan and Jos van der Ven refuse to go away from each other. But Bill Lawrence does refuse to stay with this group as he pulls out a further and further gap. So Grinnan managing the damage then struggles down the mountain once again. And just like that, goodbye says Jos van der Ven. The gap opens over half a second there, David. And for Manning Grinning, you have to feel he's got to come down in early. He'll probably note it. Well, he won't notice that he's got the damage. He won't be able to see it, but he will be able to feel that he's got damage and feel like he has to come down in and make a stop. And maybe also see the RPMs and the top speed coming down the straight here. It, he's getting you know, a little bit of the draft there, but it doesn't look as quick in a straight line as it should be. You know, when these guys take their fuel and their pit stop, they can get the car fully repaired. That's what we saw Stefan Roestchen did. So if you're in this situation that Manning Grinnan is in, you're right. If you take that pit stop earlier, get that front wing straightened out, get all the aero working as it was designed, maybe that's his best strategy to get second place or even potentially catch Bill Wallace. Well, it's up to Manning Grinnan to make sure that he works that. He's got a few seconds back to Philippe Chauvin, which he will try and use as much as possible. Into the picks comes Kenneth Baldwin out of fifth position right now as Wally Molesby under pressure from Bruce Poole, who has already come down in and made his stop. Down to the inside goes Bruce Poole at Murray's, but can't quite make the move and runs wide on the exit as well, which costs him a run at turn number one out on track so still waiting for that stop to be done as Baldwin comes off of pit road out and away he goes and he will be behind this train which is not ideal there's Paolo Prato there trying to streak away 1.3 seconds down the road as well so work to be done there Mr. L uh, Mr. Baldwin yeah a lot of variation of the pit strategies in the mid pack in this race Ooh. not necessarily because it's what these guys were thinking of but i think it's just how the race has played out with the incidents that we can check gerard florison's had an issue at the forest elbow he was coming down into it and there was damage on the rear wing i think he got a tap oh he got a big tap that was a massive massive hit there from kenneth Duma. i think Duma lost the rear of the car potentially i need to have a second look at this one because it was very difficult for me to uh, apportion this in terms of what kenneth Duma was able to do oh he just got himself loose on the brakes did Duma? he snapped right the same way that uh, i believe captain morgan did and he just took the rear out of floris and he'll be going what happened i think erickson really did hit me yeah, precisely over the top of the mountain here, there's so many little crests, little bumps, little camber changes, where if you have the steering loaded up too much, the throttle or the brakes, it'll catch you out. And, it, and the rear has lost for him there as he's got too much right-hand steering angle in as he's trying to brake the car. Bill Lawrence, race leader on pit row of lap number nine, out off of his box. He goes with a perfect pit stop and he will find himself in exactly where he wants to be on circuit. Clean-ish air because he's got Remigio de Pasqua who's trying to close down. He's in a scrap with Joel Martin. 
Now here's the interesting scenario here. If DePasco was able to have caught there, he may have had the ability to overtake. Remember, there's no obligation for any vehicles to uh, to hold their positions or actually let themselves get lapped. It's the responsibility of the passing car to go and make the move. Exactly. If Bill Lawrence pits early, puts himself into traffic, it's not that traffic's fault. They're running their own race as they are entitled to. One thing I saw there, from Bill Lawrence's pit stop though, 11 seconds stationary. That's about three seconds longer than Jos van der Ven did in race one. If Jos van der Ven can pull that off again, but he doesn't have as much slip streaming as he did last race. But that could put them very, very close together if Jos van der Ven has been thinking about that, managing his fuel number, and if he's learned from the first race exactly how much to take. Well, Jos van der Ven is trying to break Manning Grinnan, and Grinnan refuses at eight tenths of a second back on that last lap, as he has just been soldiering on in terms of this event and has been holding himself station. The responding comes both of them down onto the lane, and that can be very, very dangerous as we see who is the more aggressive onto the lane. The answer is not Manning Grinnan, as he very much does not note where the yellow cone is, and he's probably dropped himself. Probably about two seconds there, just by not knowing where the yellow cone is there, David. Exactly, I mentioned that in the first race, and it's critical, critical. Any race with a pit stop in it, you've got to practice your pit entry, know where all of the time is on the table, because you don't do the pit entry every lap, and some people just forget, but all of the track before the pit limiter starts, that's racing surface, and you're out there, you're racing. You wouldn't go slow through any of the other corners. Who's that who's blown an engine? That's Bill Lawrence. That's Bill Lawrence who's just blown his engine out of turn one. He was jumped in the stop. Bang, bang, bang. Blows the engine into turn number one. And there goes the puff of smoke. And there is a major puff of smoke, which will be very, very frustrating as he says, I blew it over the radio. Bill Lawrence is out, effectively, of this race now, David. And that is a hammer blow to him and delight for Jos van der Ven, who now leaves this event again by a very similar margin as he did in the opening race. Yeah, we get the replay of that rotary engine blowing up and maybe just the downshift into the final corner. He got it wrong. When we saw it on the screens at first, I didn't want to... Oh, Vandervan's in the wall! Vandervan's in the wall at the Big Dipper! Oh, my goodness! It's all happening here! Vandervan has thrown the race away. It's okay because he won race number one, but this gives Manning Grinnan maximum opportunity to attack just like that. Bathurst has struck twice. My word, I, I, I'm short of words for this, Jake. Manning Grinnan, though, inherits the race lead and a healthy one, too. But then in second place is now Stefan Roosjen. Yes, but you have to remember, Roosjen, well, actually, has to come down in, potentially, and make another stop. So, Stefan... This is where you go maximum fuel save. You've seen rivals go off, Van der Ven's off. You've seen what's happened to uh, Unsby in the early stages. He's a lap down. This is Roosjens for the taking to extend his championship lead. He will gain four points by finishing in second position as things stands, which means the gap goes back up to 12. It will extend to 17 if he can get past Man and Grinnan, but crucially, that stop comes into play. Don't count Chauvin out either. 5.6 back off the lead, currently on his debut weekend, is third. Yeah, that's a great result from Philip Chauvin. But I disagree with you on what Roistian needs to do. I think he needs to push, get in the draft of Manning Grinnan. I think he can make it to the end on fuel. He does these last tap, couple laps in the draft, and then maybe make a big move into the chase or the final corner on the last lap. Well, he's got draft here through Remigio de Pasqua. He won't be as quick, but he will be very, very useful up the mountain if Rosgen wants to start thinking about it. And believe me, he 
certainly does at this stage. The race has turned on a dime, as many a Bathurst race has done before, as De Pasqua releases Stefan Rosgen down the mountain, through the rights and lefts. Here's where Van der Ven had his big moment, and you can see just how wide Man and Grinnan was, trying to gather the vehicle back up again. He senses the pressure of the championship leader, two-term champion, and Grinnan knows Rosgen's coming. Yes, championship leader, two-time champion, and proud owner of some new load cell pedals. There is magic in this mountain, Jake, but Bill Lawrence and Van Der Ven in this race will be thinking that it's a curse on them. Oh, they will. Manning Grinnan, though, who had a Grinnan as large as the Cheshire Cat did earlier on about a lap ago, now has himself a slightly concerned face with the quick Stefan Roosgen just behind. He won't know that Roosgen pitted early. He won't know just how aggressive Roosgen is trying to be to stay within the draft. And he gets within that one second window. Jack down to seven tenths of a second. A very telling seven tenths as Kenneth Baldwin and Bruce Poole are having an almighty scrap behind for fifth position. And they almost ran into each other as Bruce Poole went Banzai down to the inside, backed out of it, but still decided he wanted to try and make the move. Almost took the rear away from Baldwin there, David. Yep, and these guys racing a little bit further down in the pack, but they've got that opportunity to get some great results here because some of our top runners are having an off day. And if you're a mid-pack driver, those are the days where you need to bring your best, pick up maximum points. Last lap around, Stefan Roosten set the fastest lap of the race. He's listening to me and not listening to you, Jake, because the pedal is all the way down. It is all the way down. I remember once actually uh, broadcasting a race around this track. There were 24 drivers in Formula Renaults. The answer was, well, actually it was in Pro Masters. There were 24 Pro Masters. Only six made it to the finish line after one hour's worth of racing. Stefan Roosgen wants to get past Manning Grinnan, but the mountain can bite back at any given point in time. There is two laps to go the next time they cross the line and Manning Grinnan, well, he'll be seeing this and going, please turn left, please turn left into pit road. I want to escape and come out of this one with a victory. Let's not count out Mark Robertson in fourth though. He has a chance to get to Philip Chauvin if he keeps slowing down like this. Six tenths off on that last lap. Any mistakes though, will be capitalized on. That's the nature of this circuit here, uh, David. Yep, look at that uh, sort of little lap graphic there. Six tenths of a second, Roosten took out of Grinnan on the last lap. And now he's just there, maybe saving a little bit of fuel now, because he's not as quick on this lap. In fact, he's eight tenths of a second slower than his last lap around. Manning Rinnan could still win this, Stefan Roosten could still win this. I'm not sure who's got it. And further back in the pack, for fifth and for ninth, there's plenty of good racing as well. Yep, Kenneth Baldwin and Bruce Poole, they stay line astern. Keep an eye out on ninth though, because Wally Molesby's had an issue and Molesby's in the wall and out of this one. It was a career best, I think, for Molesby, who's up and over and John Hunsby just about escapes it. So the 98 runs into trouble coming out of the forest elbow. That one all on his own. And just looking at it, then he just pancakes the wall on the inside, smashes the wall on the outside. And just like that, Wally Molesby is out of the event with two to go at the end. We'll focus, though, on Kenneth Bottle and Bruce Paul for the moment here, David, because Bruce, well... Very Australian name, Bruce. I think Bruce, like the shark from Finding Nemo, wants to bite. Yes, pro Mazdas are friends, not food. It's probably what Bruce Paul isn't thinking, because he would love, dearly love, a top five Whoa. finish here. What a line that was from Kenneth Baldwin. He was not concentrating through McPhillamy Park, and he is lucky he's still got a car there, David. Yeah, anywhere over the top of this mountain, if you're a little bit offline, it could bite you. Oh, Replay comes up. 
Oh, yeah, for the lead, Stefan Rostchen has gone to the inside of the chase. White flag will be out when they cross the finish line in two corners. Oh, time. they hit! And they touch! Wow! Rostchen goes around, grid and make contact, and Rostchen now will not get any more points. And if you thought that this 14 laps could not throw anything else up, well, my dear sirs and madams, you are seriously mistaken. Roasted and Grinnan come together in the battle for the lead. Manning Grinnan was uh, very even on the brakes, but he just clatters the inside curb, which gives him no grip whatsoever. Has to straighten out the car. Roasted ran the perfect line in the middle, and bang, around goes Roasted. Manning Grinnan will reap the rewards as Roasted comes down in for a second time in this event. It promotes Philippe Chauvin up into second position, and Mark Robertson into third, which will be massive massive for his championship but after what was happening to be a very very poor race indeed by his standards he will be happy about the way that that one has pulled out rose jen i believe has just got out of pit road no he hasn't that's wally molesby so it will be a long time coming before we see the final of rose jen come out of pit road but the battle for fourth position now baldwin versus pool is still on as they get themselves up towards the cutting turn number three and four out on track Baldwin we've seen make a couple of mistakes in this event Bruce Ball has been very very solid if not unspectacular so far as they make their way up through Griffin's Mount and now heading themselves to Solomon Park this first left-hander the Frog Hollow the second left-hander down this small little dip and up again. McPhillamy Park, third left-hander in a row. Now pick your line as you head yourself to Brock Skyline and back down the hill once more. Oh, mistake! Into the wall goes Kenneth Baldwin. The pressure was too much and Bruce Poole does enough to pull himself fourth position. But to Manning Grinnan, we will turn. It's not been the easiest day. He's made contact on two occasions. One his own fault, the other wasn't. And now for Grinnan, he fakes, well, he makes it to the final few corners through the chase for the final time he will smile but he will smile sheepishly at the way he's won this event today Manning Grinnan makes it to the final corner and will pick up a race victory here at Mount Panorama fantastic result by his standards Philippe Chauvin first week in the series and it's a second place finish for him he will be ecstatic at that result as third position will go to Mark Robertson who keeps his championship alive with 26 very important points that he will cash off in the bank. Bruce Paul will finish fourth. Kenneth Baldwin will come home in fifth position. And it's a long, long wait back to Paolo Preto. David, I think that's the most exciting for, um, race that we've seen in a very long time. Battle for eighth, though, still going here as they make their way through the chase. Yeah, but I think we're on board with Jay Friels, who might be just a little bit too far back from Greg Garris. But, you know... <laughs> Whatever lap, whatever corner, action can happen here. Never count anything out at Mount Panorama. Uh, and, you know, some guys having a great race, capitalizing on this. Jay Fields goes really deep on the brakes into the chase, but it's not enough. He'll need a mistake from Greg Garris in the final corner if he's going to make up any more positions than the 18 that Jay Friels has already gained in this race. They'll come across the finish line, and indeed, it'll stay in that order. But this race gave us plenty on every single lap. It did. It certainly did. Stefan Roshan will finish this one one lap down as Bill Lawrence desperately looks to chase down Bob Kern, but he will run out of time no matter what he tries on his 2.033 lap times and does himself a 2.024 to finish. Fastest lap of the day. Thank you very much. But my goodness, there have been some fantastic drives up and down this field. Only 16 finishes, well, 15 finishes even, will go on the leading lap. This is race done, though, and this is how things will pan out. Manning Grinnan takes it, but with controversy after contact with two laps to go at the chase. He wins by eight seconds over Philippe Chauvin, the Frenchman, with Mark Robertson finishing home in third, a vital third position by his standards. Bruce Paul finishes fourth, taking the position away from Kenneth Baldwin, who had an incident on the final lap of this race. Paolo Preto, almost a minute back 
in sixth position with Franz Brink moving up 21 positions to get himself into seventh place. Greg Garris moves nowhere in eighth. Jay Friels finishes ninth up ninth or 18 of his own with John Unsby rounding out the top 10 and John Morgan finishing in 11th. Bob Kern finishes 12th with Bill Lawrence blowing his engine and can only manage 13th. Jared Florison is the last finisher in 14th position with Stefan Roshen getting taken out with two to go and that means 15th position from what could have been a race victory. Jack Turner also one lap down as is Remigio de Pasqua, Joel Martin, Wally Molesby having a big issue as Gianni Raspalo finishes also a lap down with Richard Coulomb and Kenneth Duma on the third page. Louis Morgas two laps down, David Riley four, and those who failed to finish, Jos van der Ven, an issue heading through the dipper. Mark Lazon, PJ Sally, Stephen Karkner had his big issue from the race lead, which massively affected this race. Paolo Bonacera and Fred McIntosh did not start this event. Oh my goodness, tempers will flare after a race like this, but we'll go and get interviewed straight away. We've got the driver who came home third in this event, Mark Robertson. Mark, uh, third position, it seemed that you didn't have the pace here today to really challenge at the high end of the field, but attrition played its role, and now you have some big, big points to boost your championship. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what uh, I was counting on today. Um, I, I knew I wasn't as fast as the rest of them. I, uh, like you said, it was just attrition and uh, ended up in a good spot. I was surprised that I ended up that high, but it worked out. It certainly did work out for you. And a quiet race by your standards didn't really have anyone to really uh, think about or focus on in terms of battling too much in this event. But let's talk about how difficult this track is because it's caused a lot of drivers out today in a number of places. Do you feel like an o like? shall we say, street circuit style tracks like this one, maybe even tracks like Belle Isle. Do you feel like they separate the good drivers from the great drivers? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it. Uh, this is like Belle Isle or any uh, street circuit with concrete barriers, except with, uh, you know, up and downhill. And for me, the downhill part is white knuckle all the way for me. That's, uh, I... I I uh, aired a caution uh, going down the hill, so that slows my times down, but uh, hopefully I'm, I'll be there at the end. Well, you certainly did get there at the very, very end. So just looking at the schedule then, moving forward for this season. Next up, some O-Sport, which is going to be another very, very quick circuit, very similar in some respects due to the uh, flowing nature of some corners, but a high-speed circuit coming up for you. Of course, on Race Spot, we'll be back for the finale at Sebring, but for you, most sport coming up, how are you feeling about it? I like uh, the most sport track. Uh, we, we had some issues with ride height on our... Pro, Pro Mazda there last year with uh, bottoming out and uh, especially uh, coming on the front straight just past the start finish line that put a lot of people off track so we're going to be looking at that real close to make sure we got our ride height uh, r correct so uh, we don't have any more of that but it's typically a track I do fairly well at I think well we hopefully will see that shout out sponsors though who gets it done well, I don't have any sponsors. My family, uh, my teammates, Team Morgan. Uh, I want to uh, give out a warm welcome to, uh, we've got some new participants that came in, uh, probably three, four, maybe five. So I want to give them a warm welcome and uh, enjoy competing with them. And uh, of course, we love Race Spots coverage, so keep it up. Thank you very much. Mark Robertson with a big third position there. He definitely, definitely need it. So right now, David, final thoughts then as we just close the curtain here from Mount Panorama. Yeah, well, it, it, it doesn't matter who's driving and what cars you bring to Mount Panorama. Uh, there will be drama and action of 
some kind. We've got the upcoming rounds on the screen right now and it shows round six. That's us where we are right now. They've got a few more races until we will be back broadcasting the season finale from Sebring. Every time that we check in with this series, they are at a world famous circuit, one that is known for throwing up some action. And I'm sure we'll get that again in the future, exactly like we had in both races today. Yep, certainly does. So in six weeks' time, we'll be back then here on Racebot TV and iRacing Live for that. But that's all we're going to have time for here this evening. So our thanks go to the people who get it done for us. Firstly, to Antvern Designs, the official graphics partners here at Racebot TV, along with ATPO and Actioneer, the official graphics engine here at Racebot TV. We have ourselves the likes, of course, of our live timing and scoring, which is brought to you by Nick Thissen, as well as our animations by Simon Grossman and this Van Ballo's Track Cams 22, the cameras that you have seen, the angles around this track. Make sure you check out his wonderful, wonderful work that he gets done. But of course, that's not all that we have here on RaceSpot TV, which will be going on over the course of this week because we have ourselves the finale of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series, a vital, vital race, which could crown a new champion or a three-time dynasty for Martin Cronke. It's Martin versus Mitchell, and we're deep in the heart of Texas at Austin, Texas, for that one. Circuit of the Americas will make sure to be an important race that you will get to watch on the IRC Esports Network. We've got the likes then of the major series. It's penultimate round from Bathurst. We're coming back here for the Bathurst 500. That will be a good three, three and a half hours of that. The start of the near endurance series, six hours of Sebring. Make sure you keep an eye on that one as well as the likes of Racebot TV Primetime, which will be at Montreal with the IMSA Sports Car Championship, as well as Midget Nationals, which will be done very early in the morning with Brett Wheeler. And of course, David Haynes will be back for that. And don't forget Pro Master either. More action of that, you want more? Go to Mo Sport with Johnny Jonathan Simon. But that's David Haynes, Hugo Louise behind the camera. I'm Jake Sperry, and that is why Bathurst is one of the greatest circuits in the world. You do not know what racing is going to be until you see it through your own eyes. Good night.